I don't mean to brag, but I've seen video games pre-release. No, no, please, hold your applause. I'm, I'm just an everyday man. But several different times, I've had the privilege of seeing an early build of an unreleased game, one that the public hasn't gotten to see. These are almost always NDA'd to hell. I am always very much not allowed to talk about the specific games or builds that I've seen. The truth is, there's not that much to say. Games in progress are typically like finished games, except worse. They feel less good to control. The sound design is absent. Much of the environment is made out of placeholders. Assuming you don't, like, die before the finished game comes out, that final product is almost always the one that is more interesting and rewarding to play. But sometimes, very infrequently, I've run across a situation that's different. It's not that the game has been better pre-release, but I have been privy to developers trying to decide between a couple very different routes a game could go down. I know ultimately they'll choose one route, and the other options will just disappear forever. And when I've been present at those crossroads moments, I always think, someone should save this. This is not a thought you're allowed to have when under NDA for a big organization. Even if I did save something, which I am very much not allowed to do, my hard drive would probably burn out before I could legally do anything interesting with it. And that's assuming that anyone cares as much as I do about this random thing that didn't ultimately end up happening. Sometimes, if we're very lucky, Game studios will do that work themselves. Something like Double Fine's documentaries preserve these discarded ideas and conversations. Sometimes art books or developer presentations will key us into visions of the game that never happened. But examples of this are both rare and limited. Even the documentary Psych Odyssey, which is over 20 hours long, is only showing us glimpses. Any future research on Double Fine will be bound by what previous documentarians chose to capture and what the studio chose to preserve. What's left out of that picture? And how incredible would it be to get that same level of insight into Shadow of the Colossus, or Super Metroid, or Metal Gear Solid 4? So I have this impulse to squirrel things away. It is an impulse I ignore, but I cannot deny the thought. Even if I was to start saving stuff, I would also be just a total amateur. Me and a little hard drive full of secrets? What would I even do with it? But in the realm of video game history, this is kind of how it works. We would just, we would have nothing if it weren't for people at least taking some risks with that stuff. Maybe taking things or shared things that they weren't supposed to. Um, or maybe, you know, accidentally left it at their desk or accidentally left it outside or something along those lines. We owe so much of what we know about video game history to people at least bending the law, if not outright breaking it. My concerns about records of development disappearing does feel a little like worrying about singeing my breakfast toast while the city outside burns to the ground. The Video Game History Foundation recently published their findings that 87% of classic games are essentially unavailable. But the way the law is set up in the US, your only option for 87% of these games are uh, piracy or, uh, you know, maintaining expensive collectibles. And for the record, classic games is defined as games through 2009. Halo 3 is a classic game at this point. Mirror's Edge is a classic game. Super Mario Galaxy, a classic game. This is, as the Foundation points out, just slightly better than the survival rate of pre-World War II audio recordings, and worse than the availability of American silent films. The entirety of the existence of this medium could be contained within a lifetime, my parents' lifetime, and yet most of it does not exist outside inaccessibly priced classic hardware and iffy ROM sites that could disappear tomorrow. Piracy is great, but it is not, it can't be the only solution for things. You know, we, we can't be relying on just the curation of, uh, of pirates and the help of pirates to make sure that everything um, 
is safe. If there's no other way to access these things, we are gatekeeping a big part of history. We need libraries to be allowed to share these games with people in a way that is slightly more convenient than you can walk into your library, they can plop a PS2 that they're maintaining on the counter, they can put in a, you know, a disc and you can play through all of Kingdom Hearts right there. It should be, you know, if you want to learn about Shakespeare, it's not like you have to go to a weird Discord to learn about how to do that, you know? <laughs> Why should it be the case for learning about Miyamoto? What Kelsey says makes sense. The current copyright law is designed to protect the industry's ability to sell things. It is not designed with any safeguards against companies burning their own history to make their profit line go up. Depending on your region, the Wii had more than twice as many games available on its virtual console in 2009 as the Switch does now. Digital storefronts continue to shut down, the 3DS, the Wii U, gone. Literally the morning I wrote this paragraph, the news broke that the Xbox 360 store will be closing next year, meaning that hundreds of non-backwards compatible games will, essentially, disappear. Here's the thing I'm not supposed to say. Sometimes I, I struggle to care as much as I feel like I'm supposed to. This is probably in part because of the false safety net of piracy, that if I wanted, I could probably search for whatever game ISO and get it running. But I also scroll through the list of games not backwards compatible on the Xbox 360, games that will truly go away when the storefront goes down and it's like, your shape, fitness evolved, or Tiger Woods PGA Tour 12, or Turbo Super Stunt Squad. And I look at those and think, would we really be losing important historical artifacts if these became unavailable? And even those titles come from years when the total number of games released could be measured in the hundreds? What about now, when Steam sees almost a thousand releases per month, when Itch.io gets untold hundreds a day? And many of those games are far more fascinating than the Xbox 360 games that are about to disappear, but I think about the raw amount of data we're producing now, every moment more stuff to save and post and host somewhere, and it… it starts to stress me out. Look, just a few minutes ago I was talking about how cool it'd be to have a version history of games in development so we could see where the cool decision points were made, but here's the flip of that. I used to work at a normal office -y job with a normal office -y local storage network. And whenever we made an internal PowerPoint or public post or weekly meeting document, we'd save it as a new copy so we had a comprehensive version history. If you wanted to look at a PowerPoint, you could see the original and then a separate version where someone had gone in and improved the wording and then a new one where someone had found a better resolution photo and fixed some typos and then you get it. This came in handy more than once. Sometimes a person would fix something that didn't actually need to be fixed. Sometimes a file would get corrupted, and hey, what do you know, there was a previous version we could hop back to. But the company was 20 plus years old and had been doing this for basically its whole existence, and I would sometimes click into an old folder by mistake and find myself among a dozen different versions of the same document that hadn't been accessed since 2005. Why hold on to all that stuff? Isn't that just digital litter? I don't want to overstate the problem here. Text files and PowerPoints like this take up very little room. The company had like 18 employees, we weren't running a server farm. But because storage is so cheap, because it's way easier to just buy a few more terabytes than sort back through 20 years of work, I do think it's a little strange that we've all been enabled to become like digital hoarders, right? Is that an inappropriate word for it? Or no matter how old or useless a file is, it's simply not worth the effort to throw it away? Sometimes I like to peruse the subreddit r slash data hoarders, which is devoted to this kind of thing. Here's someone who keeps 276 terabytes under their bed. Here's a graph of a guy who transferred the better part of a petabyte of research data over his university internet. Here's a million people complaining about how Amazon delivered their hard drives. And within all this, there's a lot of cool stuff. 14,000 PDFs of 
Lego instructions, 39,000 separate electronic repair guides for my fix-it, a complete catalog of basically everything related to the January 6th riots so no one can wipe it from the internet. But there's also hundreds of people with vast amounts of storage for God knows what. The most common joke is everyone is just storing uh, adult entertainment. It seems like the place to go when you just have an overwhelming anxiety about even a single bite being lost. Jorge Luis Borges has a one paragraph short story that details an unnamed empire absolutely consumed with the search for perfection in data. Any usable map, for instance, was necessarily imperfect because shrinking down the land mass onto a piece of paper would require losing some of that land's detail. And so instead, the empire's cartographers created a map whose size was that of the empire and which coincided point for point with it, a perfectly accurate creation that was perfectly useless because to examine it would require traversing the same distances it charted. In the story, later generations let it decay, its only remnants are in the desert, where tattered ruins of the map are inhabited by animals and beggars. The title of the story is On Exactitude in Science. It's fun to think in these extremes. In 2020, PhD physicist Melvin Vopsin wrote a paper called The Information Catastrophe, in which he predicted that if the digital bits of information we produce on Earth continues to grow at around 20% per year, in 350 years, the number of bits produced will exceed the number of all atoms on Earth. If that wasn't enough, in merely 250 years, the power required to sustain this digital production will exceed this much, i.e. the total planetary power consumption today, and to cap it all off, in 500 years, the digital content will account for more than half of the Earth's mass, according to the Mass Energy Information Equivalence Principle. It is not personally something I'm losing too much sleep over. If we can make it to the point where the information catastrophe poses a real threat, it'll be because we've overcome some other, much closer catastrophes. But Vobson's projection is absolutely Borges-like in its scale. The mass of the Earth, overwhelmed with the digital memory of everything everyone has ever experienced and chosen to save. Last year, Simon Garfield published a non-fiction book called all the knowledge in the world. It's a more approachable subject than the title might suggest. It's a history of the encyclopedia. Although Garfield's book is a mere 400 pages, it paints a picture of how encyclopedias at more than one time in history have aspired to gather all the knowledge in the world. For instance, in the year 1400, in China's Ming Dynasty, the Yongle Emperor Zhu Di commissioned an encyclopedia of near incomprehensible scale. Thousands of scholars wrote a total of 11,000 volumes, each an inch or two thick, covering 23,000 chapters, an equivalent of 250 million words, six times larger than the entire Encyclopedia Britannica. Each volume bound in yellow damask silk, the compiled collection takes up 1,400 cubic feet. Or rather, it did. That particular version of all the world's knowledge has disappeared over the centuries, lost to fire, war, colonialism. Just over 400 of the original 11,000 volumes still exist, spread across the world in various libraries and private collections. It was called the Yongle Dadian, or the Yongle Encyclopedia. If you want an encyclopedia that's more comprehensively titled, may I suggest instead checking out the German Great Complete Encyclopedia of All Sciences and Arts, which was originally published under the more ambitious name, Great Complete Encyclopedia of All Sciences and Arts, which so far have been invented and improved by human mind and wit, including the geographical and political description of the whole world with all monarchies, empires, kingdoms, principalities, republics, free sovereignties, countries, towns, sea harbors, fortresses, castles, areas, authorities, monasteries, mountains, passes, woods, seas, lakes, 
and also a detailed historical and genealogical description of the world's brightest and most famous family lines, the life and deeds of the emperors, kings, electors, and princes, great heroes, ministers of state, war, leaders, equally about all policies of state, war, and law, and budgetary business of the nobility and the bourgeois, merchants, traders, arts. Hello, Jacob from the future here. With further research, it appears that most English versions of this title, including the one printed in Garfield's book, actually abridge over half of the words. In the pursuit of greatest accuracy, here's the full, unabridged title in its original language. Enjoy it, you freaking nerds. What's fascinating about each encyclopedia, no matter how many million words, is that they do necessarily fail in their task. No matter how many thousands of authors contributed from how many countries, most of everything would inevitably be left out. And now, for many old encyclopedias, their historical value lies not in what they got right, but their specific inaccuracies. Garfield's book makes the case that each encyclopedia is a compelling and culturally valuable object, not because any of them actually achieved their goal of gathering all the knowledge in the world, but because their successes and failures, their preoccupations and prejudices, provide valuable insight into the world they were first published. Through the history of encyclopedias, he paints a picture of how knowledge was gathered, stored, and sold to the public. Why am I talking about encyclopedias? Because for my whole life, I would visit my grandma and see a shelf, a large shelf, with a massive set of Encyclopedia Britannicas on it, a set that my grandpa got at a yard sale, because who would throw out an encyclopedia? I recently learned that behind that set of Britannicas was in fact another set of encyclopedias, a beautiful set of 1968 world books in off-white and green that my father read cover to cover as a kid. I have to imagine that neither set had been touched in 25 years, at least. But there they sat, probably 300 pounds, two layers thick of all the knowledge that could be contained in thousands upon thousands of pages. Of course, the punchline to my grandparents' collection, the punchline patiently waiting through all of Simon Garfield's discussion of previous centuries, is that now, in the 21st century, we kind of have a repository of all knowledge available to us, weightlessly, instantly. Wikipedia is far larger, has far more words and entries than even an emperor could have assembled, and each article is then linked to even more comprehensive sources on each topic, a monumental collection of knowledge, still flawed, still incomplete, but somehow existing. Do you know you can download it? Per Wikipedia itself, a text-only download of just the current pages would run you less than 25 gigabytes of space, not a shelf double-stacked full, not even a flash drive, less than the storage requirements of Metal Gear Rising Revengeance for the abridged version of all human knowledge. If you wanted to get the media too, all the pictures and videos and audio files used across Wikipedia, it'd run you a slightly heftier 428 terabytes still probably lighter than my grandparents' bookshelf. Maybe most interesting to a researcher like Simon Garfield is the downloadable page history for each entry, the forum discussions, every version of every article, the evolution of knowledge and framing over time. It's like a million editions of an encyclopedia in one database. Here's the next question. How long will it last? That world book my dad read is 55 years old. The Yongle Encyclopedia, with only two copies ever made, disappeared over the course of 600 years. Wikipedia, at present, is 22 years old. We can keep it, store it, on flash drives and cloud storage and NAS arrays kept under the bed. Will that last for longer? The Internet Archive is essentially the dream of the data hoarder, a library of everything kept forever. The Wayback Machine is one of the projects of the Internet Archive, a tool that saves previous versions of websites. It's a tool I use for research constantly because there are vanishingly few outlets that have any interest in preserving their own history. 
The larger part of the archive is 41 million books and texts, 14 million audio recordings, 8.5 million videos, 4.5 million images, and just under a million software programs. Three years ago, one of the archive staff guessed it had about 70 petabytes of stuff in storage. Not the biggest storage operation on the planet, but certainly one of the biggest public efforts to save all the knowledge, art, everything in the world. It has historically been far more accessible than any similar pursuit, so much so that all the recent stories about the Archive have focused on the attempts to dismantle it. But it does also raise an interesting question about the difference between a library and an archive, a collection, and a hoard. Years ago, I talked about the criteria libraries used to determine what they kept on shelves. How the goal was not simply to have every book ever written available for checkout. Librarians prune their shelves, get rid of books, replace them, keep things updated. But the goal of the Internet Archive is exactly that. Every book, page, thing ever written. It's a dizzying technological achievement to be able to store the volume of content the Internet Archive does, an impossible gift to researchers and historians. It's also giving information catastrophe a little bit. Is it not? How many billions of bytes are stored to give me the privilege of seeing what the website for Cookout looked like at 458 different points in time? But then, what if we can't? What if one of the many lawsuits against the Archive succeeds in stripping it for parts? The bizarre contradiction of our digital age is that we are empowered, encouraged even, to save everything. Buy more storage on Google Drive, back up your whole computer. And yet, how far does our possession of that data actually extend? As unstable as our physical world is, the internet might be more so. In an article by Daniel Green entitled Landlords of the Internet, he dissects how our online spaces are predominantly owned by what are essentially real estate firms, companies like Equinix and Digital Realty. These corps are, in square footage, far larger than Google or Facebook, and they hold the infrastructure that keeps the internet running. We're all essentially renting our online existence from these invisible companies, and, like any property rental, that means we're subject to being screwed over by our landlords at any given time. The internet does not exist in a democratized cloud. It exists as massive for-profit infrastructure. Infrastructure that even the most noble pursuits are necessarily built on top of. And it's with this in mind that I return to those two layers of encyclopedias on my grandma's shelf. They are not trash not to her, even though the volumes might be too unwieldy for her to actually open anymore. She worries about the idea of replacing this massive physical proof of accumulated knowledge with the uneasy omnipotence of the internet. Though I doubt she knows any more about the physical wires and corporations than the rest of us, she probably also suspects it could disappear, like so many yellow, silk-bound volumes. And then, by God, we'd all be fortunate to have a shelf full of two collections of everything. It's hard to fault her for this. One of my little pet theories is that the repopularization of vinyl as a format amongst young people isn't just a nostalgic throwback, but one of the few ways we can actually own the media we like in a format that can't be taken away. No matter how much money I've paid Spotify over the years, nothing I can do will prevent it from just vanishing one day, taking that infinite library of music with it. Buying a movie on Amazon or iTunes is only good until they decide to stop hosting it. Streaming has no obligation to keep what you enjoy in stock. A vinyl album for as big and clunky as it is, we'll play the songs I enjoy as long as record players still have needles. Have you ever heard of Marion Stokes? It'd be understandable if not. As a young adult, she was an activist, librarian, producer of a local TV show. None of these are particularly notable. But in 1977, Marion Stokes started taping what was being shown on the news and she simply did not stop. 
24 hours a day, no breaks, no holidays. As cable news grew, so did the scale of her recording, capturing up to eight channels at a time, still exclusively on VHS tapes. She did this for 35 years straight. The collection, 70,000 tapes long, ended only at her death December 14th, 2012. That day's breaking news, the last moments captured, is the Newtown Elementary School shooting. What is the difference between a collection and a hoard? To Stokes, the purpose of her project was the preservation of facts, an indisputable archive of how stories were told and framed and changed over time. As a young activist, she was surveilled by the CIA. As an obsessive observer of media, she saw the way stories were presented to sculpt a particular reaction. And her reaction was to document everything as comprehensively as she knew how. Let's skip to the end of the story briefly. After her death, her son donated the collection to, who else, the Internet Archive. Roger McDonald, head of the television section of the archive, said the collection is absolutely unprecedented, heroic. Even the television stations that originally aired this stuff had long since recorded over many of their tapes. The level of history Stokes preserved for the world is almost indescribable. Now let's jump back to the middle of the process. Stokes, while recording, had no idea what she was going to do with the tapes. Her son described her as owning 40, 50,000 books. He said she read 11 newspapers a day and never threw any of them away, nor would she throw away anything else. She was an intense person, what the people around her politely referred to as dogmatic. She lived estranged from her son for many years, had no time for other family members. I mean, she was a woman who ran eight tape recorders at a time for 35 years. If you heard about a person like that, would your first response be, what a hero? In the documentary, other people remark that the difference between a collection and a hoard is the value that someone else can find in it. The 70,000 tapes Stokes recorded without ever having a plan for what she would do with them, an invaluable collection, the dozens of diner-style syrup containers kept in garbage bags in rooms she never entered, obviously a hoard. Except those lines can only be cleanly drawn in retrospect. If the Internet Archive didn't exist to digitize the tapes, if for some reason we found an incredible use for syrup containers, you see what I'm saying? To break the illusion of professionalism or whatever, the topic of this video has somehow become the exact challenge of this script. I have read so many different things for this. There are so many different aspects that could go into the video, but they can't all fit. What does ownership really mean? What's the emotional cost of holding on to everything? What's the environmental cost of keeping everything digitally preserved? Some common writing advice is just kill your darlings. That is, even your favorite individual bit of writing might be holding back the piece as a whole. Effective writing is figuring out what to throw away as much as what to keep. And I think I'm generally pretty good at that. I don't make three hour videos, but here I just keep trying to cram everything into a script that can't support it. And now I feel trapped by all the stuff I've collected. I've been thinking about my grandma again because it's not just encyclopedias in her house. They sit framed by thousands of other books, and those books live alongside dozens and dozens of genuinely beautiful pieces of art, countless CDs and vinyls, music and spoken word, a collection of ornate beer steins, clothes from my dad's siblings that haven't been worn in decades, old handbags, dolls, empty cardboard boxes in case anything needs to be packaged. Often, when I come home from a visit, I have this overwhelming urge to get rid of stuff, to make sure that my drawers only contain things I actually use, to stave off the potential of that collection. In fear, I veer towards minimalism. But there are still things I keep. 
I excuse some of my vinyl, some of my local data storage, because I'm so skeptical of the continued accessibility of our online structure. I think, well, it's reasonable to want to keep that. My grandma, born Jewish in France in 1935, has better reasons to be skeptical. She has experienced everything being taken from her, her home, her friends, her parents. She is part of a generation told they could have nothing, keep nothing, maintain ownership over not even their lives. Art Spiegelman's Mouse, a set of two graphic novels illustrating his father's experiences in Poland during the war, are most commonly deployed, at least they were to me, as a way of learning about the horrors of the Holocaust. And they are certainly that. Spiegelman's dad, Vladek, was conscripted, separated from his wife, held at Auschwitz, stuffed into train cars with hundreds of the sick and dying. It is appropriately dreadful. But getting older and rereading Mouse, I find myself more and more attached to the parts I skimmed as a kid, the sections of the story that take place in the present. These depict Spiegelman's experiences with his now 70-year-old father taking place in kitchens and cars and walks around the neighborhood. And instead of the drama and horrors of concentration camps and mass graves, Vladek complains about his new wife and his aging body and how much his son paid for a tape recorder. It all feels incredibly low stakes when compared to the bits taking place during the war. But they are, I've increasingly realized, just as necessary to the story Mouse is telling. The first of the two books is named My Father Bleeds History. It's a title that not only implies the breadth of Vladek's experience, but the fact that the history is now a part of him. It is bound to his DNA. It has changed the shape of who he is. And it's with this in mind that I read Spiegelman's descriptions of his father's home. Bookshelves with piles of stationery from a hotel he once stayed at. Four 1965 calendars from a bank he didn't have an account with, water pitchers from old hospital stays, hoarded matches he can get free from businesses. Vladek holds on to a box of Special K, a cereal he would never even eat. It has salt and also sugar, for me it's poison, because he can't stand the idea of throwing any food away. Art Spiegelman wonders aloud in the book, if his characterization of Vladek is playing into stereotypes of miserly old Jews, in reality, the portrait he paints is one of a very specific trauma. Reflections of times Vladek survived only because he had the presence of mind to save something for later. It's the major source of tension between father and son in the book. Art desperately wants to learn and write his dad's story, but he is constantly frustrated by his father's behavior, behavior we can see the origins of in the history he bleeds. And ironically, Art's greatest anger at Vladek doesn't come from something he's hoarded, but one of the only things he's thrown away. His late wife's journals, in which she recorded her experience in the camps years before she would eventually kill herself. Vladek says they held too many memories. He burned them. Art yells at him, God damn you, you murderer! How the hell could you do such a thing? How can we bear to throw anything away? Except, I called my grandma a little while ago to see if she could tell me the exact edition of her encyclopedias, only to learn that she had actually given them away. All of them, both layers in the bookshelf. Last time I was there, we helped her throw out two dozen old VHS tapes of movies she hadn't watched this millennium. We found behind those tapes my grandpa's medals from World War II, artifacts that had been long hidden under piles of, like, Caddyshack II. A hoard obscuring actual sentimentality. It's too cliché to end this with some broad statement about how actual value comes from the memories we have attached to items, not the items themselves. It's true, sure, but it's 
overly simplistic, ignores the way history shapes our emotional connection to any item, ignores the way that history itself is sometimes only preserved thanks to obsessive efforts by individuals. It can't solve how much stuff we might attach our emotions to, when that attachment overrules our ability to connect to other people, when the weight of all that stuff is too great to drag into the future. I can talk all I want, cite as many sources as I can. I still don't have the answer to that. As I've been writing this, a process that's taken much longer than many of my other scripts, I keep thinking about Katamari Damashi. You know, the 2004 video game. Your only job as the five centimeter tall prince of the cosmos is to roll up everything into a massive collection. Thumbtacks, pennies, candies, cassettes, tapes, glue, flowers, golf balls, plants, birds, cereal boxes, every version of video games, computers, encyclopedias, benches, people, cars, trees, buildings, clouds, continents. Everything on Earth, rolled up, preserved, contextualized alongside every other object, a giant spinning record of anything anyone could ever wish to remember. You gather it all, present it to the king of the cosmos, he tells you, it's fine, a little disappointing. He throws it up into the sky, it becomes a star. I feel like I have to start this sponsor read with an apology, or at least an explanation. Because every other time I've been sponsored by Henson Razors, I've done something completely absurd with my facial hair, to the extent that it feels like a disappointment if I don't. However, in about a week, I'm going to be doing a 24-hour charity stream that also inevitably includes donations for me to mangle my beard, and if I humiliate myself now for this sponsor, it means I can't humiliate myself in a week for charity. Being a YouTuber is so hard. <laughs> but that notwithstanding, this is kind of the perfect video for Henson to sponsor, because what they sell is this this extremely well-designed and well-built safety razor. You order it, you receive it in the mail, that's it. No recurring subscription, no monthly boxes, just this razor, which you very easily could use for the rest of your life. But why would you want to do that? Well, here's a good reason. The longer you use it, the cheaper it gets. This thing does cost more than some random razor you'd find at the grocery store, it's true. But it's a safety razor, meaning it uses actual razor blades. So instead of paying at least $20 for a pack of like a dozen cartridges, you can pay $10 for a pack of 100 blades. This is one of those good investments people are always saying you should make. You can actually get 100 blades for free, even. More on that later. The other reason to buy one, of course, is that it gives a really nice shave. I could extend this read by another couple minutes to tell you about how they're precision engineered, how there's no real learning curve to using one, how it just feels nice to shave with something that's so clearly high quality. Probably the most meaningful recommendation I can give, though, is that next Sunday, after doing God knows what to my face for charity, shaving with this will be a little treat to my sleep-deprived self, a moment of meditation to become a human again. You can get one, a Henson razor, and maybe a moment of meditation however you want, but if you use my link in the description, you can add a box of 100 blades to your order, and those blades will be completely free. Go ahead, buy a razor you'll never have to throw away. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to get back to planning how I'm going to absolutely f up my beard. Tenho esse mar todo, todo pra Deus deu um dia após o outro. 
Thank you.